welcome to our next Nano Exploration meeting or seminar. Um, as you saw when you were coming in, uh, today's talk is being recorded and you can send it as you were coming in just to make sure that you're aware of that. Um, you should have been muted, so please keep your mute on if you're, if you're not speaking um, as we go. Uh, and try to hold your questions until the end. And you can either chat your questions uh, or you can raise your hand and we'll try to sequence the questions in the order that they have come in. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Luca Daniel, uh, who will actually uh, introduce Praneet and his talk for today. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, it is really my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Praneet Namburi today. Um, Dr. Namburi received his Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical and Electronic Engineering in 2016 from Nanyang Technology University in Singapore. He then received his PhD degree in neuroscience from MIT uh, in 2018, working in the group of Professor uh, Kei Tai. Uh, his thesis was on basolateral amygdala circuits for differentiating positive and negative associations. And the main part of his thesis was featured in the cover of the Nature magazine. He then worked as a postdoc at uh, Columbia University in the group of Dr. Elijah Issa at the intersection of neuroscience and deep learning. He is currently a postdoc in my own group, working at the intersection of art and science, specifically dancing, biomechanics, and neuroscience. And his long-term goal is to use the results of his research as a neuroscientific model of the body's control system. He is using uh, NCSoft Immersion Lab in the new Nano Building, and the ultrasound biomedical lab collaborating with uh, Brian Anthony and Misha Fagin, as well as collaborating with national level dance competitors from the MIT ballroom dance team and their coach Armin Kapacher, who is also uh, training top level international competitors. Thank you, Praneeth, for this uh, very interesting uh, lecture series. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thank you, Luca, for the kind introduction. Uh, let's get started. So, um, Okay, uh, artists produce elegant movements uh, and movements pro produced by professional dancers look elegant even to the untrained eye. Let me show you two uh, videos to uh, show you what I mean. So here's a second video. Hopefully you can tell which one's better. Uh, on the left were newcomers, on the right were world champions, uh, in case you were wondering. Um, so it doesn't have to be dancing. Uh, it, just by looking at a movement, even if you're not uh, trained in that specific uh, form, you can still tell which one uh, which one seems better. There is some sort of an intuitive thing. So what are the principles for generating elegant movements? So the main hypothesis that we're working with for today is that dancers stabilize their joints via stretches in their body rather than achieving stability through muscle contractions. So that's a mouthful, so let me break it down. So complex movements require stabilization across many joints and ideally all joints. So to illustrate, what, uh, to talk about what I'm saying, let's focus on one joint. Let's just look at the elbow. And uh, muscles, tendons, and ligaments uh, uh, stabilize joints during movement. How do they do that? So think of the muscle as, uh, think of these elements as having elastic properties similar to springs. Unlike springs, they can't push out when they're compressed. However, like springs, they can exert a pull force when they're stretched. Muscles can reduce in length in response to input from the brain and the spinal cord. Muscles can exert passive forces without neural input across a joint when stretched. Now, 
muscles can stabilize joints by holding them in place when they're contracted and exert forces. This requires neural input. They can also passively stabilize joints without requiring neural input by acting as a sling. So let's do a, uh, to get an intuition for this, let's do a simple experiment. So hold out your hand and now contract all your muscles as hard as you can. So if you did this, in step one, you're mostly using stretch-based stabilization. In step two, you deliberately engaged a contraction-based stabilization and perhaps experienced it as your arm shaking. So most of us, the problem is most of us unconsciously engage contraction-based stabilization when our body is moving. So recall that our primary hypothesis is that dancers somehow use stretch-based stabilization to move elegantly. So our experimental strategy to test if this is true is to monitor the shaking during contraction-based stabilization, which is often too subtle to notice, but we can measure it using accelerometers. So we do a very simple task. All we do is we hold, uh, hold an accelerometer in the hand and reach out in front. All we're doing is extending our elbow. So, and I'm measuring acceleration in three directions. Uh, and uh, I'm using the chip in my phone to measure the acceleration and it uses an inertial momentum unit uh, uh, if you're interested in the chips. So to detect shaking, which is a signature of contraction-based stabilization, we measure acceleration or changes in acceleration in the Z or up-down direction. So what does it look like in untrained individuals? So on the left, I'm showing you a data from untrained individuals where the gray bar shows the start of their movement. And typically what you see is a signature, uh, is a typical signature of wobble or shaking over here. Now, uh, trained dancers can do this without producing the wobble, uh, albeit they have a different signature uh, of acceleration when they move their arm. Uh, so to show you that it doesn't really look that, uh, so the wobble, where does it come from? It comes specifically from the type of control mechanism. So let's think about this for a moment. If you look at my video, uh, the, uh, let's talk about the bicep and the tricep, right? So when the bicep contracts, it can exert a force this way. And the tricep contracts, it can exert a force this way. So what typically happens is when we reach out in a, at a small level, something like this happens. Bicep contracts, tricep contracts, bicep contracts, tricep. Of course, I wildly exaggerated what I just told you about, and that doesn't, it's not typically what it looks like, but that's what we're picking up with the accelerometers. So let's call this type of control mechanism an agonist-antagonist control. Now, you can also think about the uh, tricep as a sling, uh, and the bicep is simply initiating a movement inside the sling, right? So now this is a clear mental model of what, ha what the two muscles are doing in, wh while moving in these two different ways. So during stretch-based stabilization, there would be no need to engage both the muscles. This is specifically our hypothesis. And our experimental strategy is to measure muscle activity from the bicep and the tricep to test whether this is true. Now, if uh, you're not uh, used to uh, thinking about muscle activity, uh, uh, the 30 second primer is that your brain, your central nervous system sends commands to muscles in the form of action potentials. And uh, these later set uh, a chain of chemical, uh, biochemical reactions uh, and your muscle ends up exerting forces across joints. You can pick up this electrical activity of the muscle itself by using electrodes. Here, this, this is a setup very similar to what I'm using right now. So right now I'm gonna show you activity from my tricep. So hopefully you can see the live, uh, you can see my arm. 
and you can see the activity of my tricep on screen. So if I, this is a lot of activity on my tricep. This is my tricep being relaxed. So if I reach, in most cases, what happens is something like this, right? I'm using my tricep to extend the elbow. However, I can also reach by using it as a sling with minimal tricep activity. It doesn't look like I changed very much, but it makes a huge difference, right? So one, two. So hopefully that is, it's clear that we can produce similar looking movements, but use wildly different mechanisms to produce them. All right, so uh, this was my backup in case my live demonstration didn't work. So I'll skip that. So what I just showed you was activity from my tricep muscle. Uh, on the red trace is showing uh, a root mean squared version of the activity and accompanied uh, the, in the blue trace is the acceleration in the up-down direction. So typically you see this up-down acceleration when the activity of the, uh, it, when, the when you use this agonist antagonist control. When you use stretch-based control, you, you don't have to engage the tricep. And I can do this many times, and this holds true for across all the trials. And it's very easy to re reproduce, is what I'm saying. Now, if you look at the bicep, in our mental model and one type of control, it, you need to use the bicep in both cases. The, and, the, uh, and this, sure enough, is true. In the, sec, in the stretch based control case, you're simply using the bicep to initiate the movement within the sling, which is the tricep, right? So, and we can show that it, it, one interesting observation is that if you look at the bottom right plot, which is the EMG from the bicep during stretch based control, you see that uh, the muscle activity somehow seems more reproducible across trials uh, compared to when you uh, agonist antagonist control. I don't have that much more to say on it, but it's an interesting observation. So, to recap what I've just told you, Contraction-based joint stabilization uh, has a wobble or, or shaking signature, which often is too subtle to notice, and employs agonist-antagonist control. And stretch-based stabilization uses, uh, it, sorry, technical difficulty. Stretch-based stabilization has a uh, different signature, which is characterized by the absence of the shake. And, but what type of control does it use? What is stretch-based control and where does it come from? So when uh, I did the demonstration, people typically ask me, what are you thinking about when you switch between one type of muscle uh, activity versus a different type of muscle activity? So the only thing I'm changing is I'm thinking of moving my arm the same way I move my arm when I walk. When you walk, you swing your arms, so I can modify walking and swing them in a similar fashion. So in the field of biomechanics, it is well known that during walking, energy is stored in the form of elastic stretches in muscles and re retrieved efficiently by timing the muscle contractions. So perhaps stretch-based control, the key word in the biomechanics principle being elastic stretches. So perhaps stretch-based control is the same type of control used during walking, and dancers is simply modifying walking in specific ways to produce these elegant movements. So let's restate our hypothesis now with, in light of all the new data. So muscles are often used when in a stretch state during walking, and we are saying that this applies to dancing, but maybe with bigger stretches and more muscle activity. So it appears that the length of the muscle is an important factor, and the activity of the muscle and when it happens is an important factor. So our experimental strategy would be to monitor stretches and activity in muscles and compare the patterns during walking and dancing. Uh, 
if you are uh, not speaking, could you please unmute yourself? Uh, mute yourself, sorry. Uh, all right. So uh, to monitor stretches, we use 3D motion capture. And uh, specifically, we're using 28 high-speed cameras to track the 3D locations of multiple markers simultaneously with the precision of about a millimeter at 180 frames per second. This is to monitor the length of the muscles. So for the, in this section of the talk, I'll mostly be focusing on one muscle, is the latissimus dorsi muscle, the big muscle in the back. And if you're used to looking at skeletons, it's here it is shown on a skeleton. Now, uh, on the right is an image of uh, me uh, with reflective infrared markers. So these, uh, the cameras pick up the locations of these markers and they compute the 3D location uh, very quickly and very precisely. So it's a nice system. Uh, all right, so what does it look like? What does, a how, what does seeing changes in muscle length look like? So here's a move called a spiral. Uh, so that's what that looks like, right? So, uh, Hopefully you can see the, the length of the muscle is different between this frame and that frame before I even move. Okay, so uh, to compare what, how dancers are, uh, which aspects of walking dancers are using in the, in, to create their own art form, let's first look at the role of the lat during walking. So here's a video in real, uh, not slowed down or sped up. So the main takeaway from this video is that as I walk, the length of the lat is changing. And it seems to have a specific oscillation, right? So each time I walk, it's a little bit different, but the general characteristic is that there are two bumps per uh, gait cycle. So let's uh, look at it at slow speed. So let's try to understand the two bumps, right? So the lat plays two roles during walking. One is it helps in transferring your weight from one leg to the other. In this case, it's my right lat, so it's helping transfer weight from my right leg to my left leg. And let's uh, see, this, let's monitor the state of the lat when this happens. So here's, uh, I've, uh, I've marked in uh, these gray lines, the moment that I initiate weight transfer. So weight transfer is uh, initiated by heel strike from my free leg. So that's, uh, if you look at my left leg, sorry, if you look at my left leg, that's the moment when I put my heel down, right? So it looks like the weight transfer is initiated when, uh, it, during one of the peaks of the lap, right? So, now the other role of the lat is to rotate the body and it's mostly during running and not walking, but it still plays somewhat of a, it plays a smaller role, but it still does in walking, right? So if you look at the peak of the second, uh, so what I've marked right now in gray lines is the moment when my right leg starts uh, swinging and going past my left. So it's the swing phase for, uh, people who uh, are familiar with the phases of the gait cycle, right? So the second bump happens right before I initiate my movement. So currently, uh, so perhaps we initiate movements uh, when the muscle is in a stretch state, right? So let's take a couple of dance moves and see what the lat does. Right, so here's a hip turn. In this case, my goal is rotation, so uh, anti-clockwise rotation. So I'm standing on my left foot and I'm gonna turn left. 
So you, if I slow it down, what I've marked in the white line is when my left foot starts turning. So as you can see, similar to walking, the, uh, the movement, uh, visible movement is produced at the peak of the stretch. Let's use a different move, right? So I still do anti-clockwise rotation in this move, but I'm standing on my other leg and I'm whacking my uh, left leg around the back. So here's what it looks like at normal speed, right? So one more time. So let me slow it down. So that's the background day. Yeah? I'm sure there's plenty of people who can do it much better than I executed it, but the moral of the story is you can, uh, the movement in this case, the white line represents when my left foot starts moving, right? And that happens at the peak of the stretch. So if you notice in, uh, in both walking and dancing, movements are initiated from a stretched muscle state. However, if you compare the y-axis in walking and dancing, we stretch a lot more in dancing than in walking, right? Okay, now, uh, what are some other aspects of walking that are preserved after modification into dance? So muscles are often activated, meaning they receive input from the brain. In a, when they're in a stretched state during walking. This is not categorically true, but this, is, this often comes up, right? So this is a plot from, uh, the black line represents the activity of the muscle, and, uh, sorry, the, the top EMG. Uh, and this is from a cat's uh, gastrocnemius muscle, which is a calf, uh, but we don't know if this will hold true when I repeat what I just did. So let's look at that. So I'm currently monitoring EMG and measuring the length simultaneously, and I've synchronized the two systems. So the blue trace represents the raw EMG. Let me slow that down. So, uh, as I said, the main role of the lat in walking is weight transfer, and you can see that the muscle activity is, uh, most of the muscle activity that you see is initiated right after, uh, is uh, right as the weight transfer is about to be initiated. So it's use, you use the muscle to transport yourself from here to there, right? Okay, so, but, in dancing, in the two moves that I showed you, it's mostly the rotational aspect, right? So let's see when the muscle is active. So here's the hip turn. You can see the activity of the muscle increase at the same time the movement is initiated, right? And let's do a back turn. Again, you can see muscle activity increase starting approximately about when the movement is initiated. All right, so what did we learn so far? So uh, in both dancing and walking, it appears that movements are initiated in a peak, in a stretch state of the muscle, when the muscle is in a stretch state, and it looks like the brain sends signal to the muscle at this point. All right. So to recap, contraction-based joint stabilization employs agonist-antagonist-based control, and stretch-based joint stabilization employs walking-based control. Now, this type of stabilization is useful for producing efficient, 
movements, for example, in walking, and movements that look elegant, for example, in dancing. Now, uh, it's, that's not to say that the contraction-based stabilization is completely useless. It's very useful to do damage control during accidents. So for example, I had an accident where I fell off a bike and uh, uh, my, I twisted my neck, right? So if the muscles didn't engage at that moment and use contraction-based stabilization, I would have, my neck would have been in real trouble. So uh, I'm not saying that, uh, I'm j all I'm trying to say here is that both types of stabilization are used and they have specific purposes and it is good to get control over when we use which type of stabilization. So I'd like to take the next part of the talk to relate our work to different fields. So, uh, and this will be uh, very general and review an overview. All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, robotics and soft robotics. So robotics employs rigid elements mostly, and soft robotics mostly employs flexible elements. So the question is what lies in the middle? Our body incorporates both rigid and elastic elements. And some of the structures from engineering that use both of these principles are known as tensegrity structures. Now, they are composed of elastic bands and uh, rigid bones. And when you apply an external force on them, the, the force tends to get distributed and stored as elastic stretches. Similar to, uh, perhaps, the, the, somehow we are, yeah, our body is using similar mechanisms. So here's the tensegrity model of an arm that somebody built. So the point is it has rigid and elastic elements and when the person's applying an external force, the elastic bands are stretching and those stretches are remodeling uh, the configuration of uh, the, the different parts of the system in space. So we can test this explicitly uh, and we use ultrasound imaging to test this, right? So uh, the elastic bands are similar to muscles and you can monitor length of muscles more precisely than motion tracking using, uh, uh, using ultrasound scanning. So uh, what I'm showing you right now is a cross section through my arm, my bicep specifically. So uh, if you can see my cursor, this, is the, uh, this bump is the humerus, uh, which is the, four, uh, the arm bone, right? And uh, my muscle, uh, the ultrasound probe is on top here. And this, everything in the middle is the muscle. So what we have done here is uh, the, my collaborator applied an external force on me, meaning pulled my arm. And then if I implied agonist antagonist control, this is what my response would look like. So what you're actually seeing at this phase is that the muscle is contracting. And how can you tell the distance from the ultrasound probe, which is at the top, to the bone has increased, right? And in the second video, my collaborator is doing exactly the same thing. He's still pulling my arm the same way, but I, I respond in a different way. So at this point, if uh, the bone looks like it's rotating a little bit and the muscle looks like it's stretching a little bit, right? So uh, to go back, so I started this line of thought by trying to relate our work to robotics and soft robotics. And uh, what I'm trying to say is that we can, it looks like we can employ uh, principles that are used in both areas and our body seems to be able to switch strategies when needed. 
So the next thing I want, the next fields I want to relate our work to is neuroscience and artificial intelligence. So uh, artificial intelligence in this, uh, the recent deep learning revolution, uh, one of the things that fueled it was the so-called convolutional neural networks, which are very good, sometimes even better than humans in recognizing objects, spaces, and so on. The architecture, the construction of this system was mostly inspired by how the ventral visual system is organized in the human brain, right? And now these two fields are starting to come together to uh, learn from each other and find a common language. So if convolutional neural networks were inspired by the architecture of the visual system, what sort of architectures can we design to, uh, based on the motor system, right? So this is an interesting question and I don't really have an answer. However, convolutional neural networks specifically use, derive their architecture or derive their inspiration for the architecture from the ventral visual cortex. And all we are trying to say right now is that perhaps we should be thinking about two different types of architectures. One that employs agonist antagonist based control and one that employs walking based control. Uh, it, we can, I can make speculations about what those should look like. So for example, the agonist antagonist based control should probably be something high dimensional, similar to a convolutional neural network. And walking based control probably has much fewer parameters because humans learn to dance. And uh, if you had to learn all of those parameters by somebody teaching you, it would, one lifetime would not be enough. So besides these fields, uh, our work can have impact in several fields, uh, broadly under health, wellness, and physical education. So one of my uh, friends unfortunately had a stroke and he couldn't use his uh, right arm very well. So when I showed him my demonstration, uh, talk, when, I, when I was talking about my work, he was instantly curious. So, uh, so uh, how, did you, how did you move your arm without using one of your muscles that's supposed to be controlled, uh, that supposedly has to be used, right? So this type of work can provide clues as to designing rehabilitation programs that are centered around stretch-based stabilization. Uh, this, say, this similar principle and line of reasoning can be applied to help elderly to improve balance. Uh, and all we have to work with is uh, teach them uh, more precisely how to walk or relearn how to walk. And it can, it can potentially reduce injuries during sports training and improve musculoskeletal health. So I will do a, a demonstration for the musculoskeletal health. And I'll do it in the form of video. So I think this is worth elaborating. So currently, uh, surprisingly, musculoskeletal conditions uh, are the leading contributor to disability worldwide and low back pain being a very uh, a leading cause of disability. And it's all the more important that we pay attention to things like this, especially in light of uh, our sedentary lifestyles. So uh, the uh, industry solutions currently are by using external devices, in this case, a mouse. Uh, we'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more. A mouse that uh, forces you to turn your hand a little bit when uh, you use the mouse. And a device that vibrates whenever you slouch or shocks you, whatever it is. And the, the, the advice from Cleveland Clinic is that uh, the correct sitting position, uh, it, it's all described in terms of visual uh, things, in terms of sit with your back straight and your shoulders back, right? So this is not enough of a language to precisely communicate uh, what it is. So as you saw in the tricep demonstration, you can produce a movement that looks very similar, but uh, have very different, uh, feel very different or have very different effects on your body. So uh, I'll, let me show you a uh, demonstration in the form of video. 
I apologize for the lens distortion. So this video shows which muscle we're recording from. Currently I'm recording my, from my forearm muscle. So pay attention to my computer screen where you see the muscle activity and pay attention to what I'm doing. So the muscle is not stressed when the body is relaxed and I simply put my arms up to type on my keyboard. However, if I slouch, this stresses my forearm muscles. Now, using a vertical ergonomic mouse somehow seems to mitigate this stress. However, it's not enough to use, uh, you eliminated the stress in your forearm and probably you protected yourself against carpal tunnel for a little bit, but your shoulders are still in trouble. So a better solution is to sit upright and relaxed. However, a posture that looks upright doesn't necessarily mitigate muscle stress. Here's an example. So right now I'm sitting more upright. I had to change something which was very subtle to make my muscles relax. And that comes from dance training and years of it from Armin. Um, and it's not straightforward. So the takeaway should be visual guides are really good for posture, such as those lift, uh, listed on Cleveland Clinic's website, but they're not sufficient to mitigate stress in the body. So understanding general principles of when and how muscles are efficiently used during innate movements such as walking and how we can modify these movements and adapt them to our everyday life is a potential solution that can improve musculoskeletal health. Now, the final uh, application or uh, the implication of our work, I think comes from the promise of providing a common language for movement. So movement is approached by different disciplines in their own way with their own language, right? So these are some of the disciplines that deal with movement. So currently there's a common language even across different forms of dancing. And some instructions I've heard in my own dance life I tend to be very vague, right? So uh, probably the vaguest one I've heard is do less but more. I have no idea what to do with it, right? But it can mean something to several people and they instantly get it, right? And we describe this as talent. Uh, so if our integrative approach were to provide a framework for developing a common language uh, and, ground, uh, and what would that framework look like? So I would like to use a, an analogy from the field of signal processing to illustrate what the framework would look like. So a quick recap about signal composition and decomposition, right? So it's uh, in signal processing, we learn that all signals can be decomposed into uh, sine waves. Uh, sine wave being uh, what is known as the basis function. And uh, it has three different parameters. So you can modify these parameters, right? So for example, I've created the space that describes a sine wave. So for example, the blue axis describes the amplitude, right? So if I vary the frequency, you can see the frequency of the sine wave changing. Right, so another axis encodes a different property of the sine wave, which is amplitude. And finally, the third property is phase, right? It's the shift of the sine wave. Now, this, uh, you can add different points in the space and compose different signals, right? So these are a few examples. The revolution that Fuhr, Joseph Fourier introduced was the idea that you can go from any signal and discover, you can move from the space on the left to the space on the right. 
it is not intuitive and straightforward to think about this. So what we are saying is this three-dimensional space forms a basis space for all possible one-dimensional signals. And it is simply, it is sim all you need to do is have a basis function, uh, which is a sine wave, which is characterized by three different parameters. Similarly, we believe that walking is the basis function for different types of movements. Similar to a sine wave, walking is a periodic signal. However, we don't know what the parameters in this space are composed of, but we suspect that it is something low dimensional. So if the parameters that govern these phases are perhaps, we can take a guess, the phases of the gate cycle, then different movement disciplines simply become subspaces within this basis space. Now the common language is across disciplines then would be a language that uh, describes all of their teachings and art forms using the parameters in the space. But we need more work to figure out what the parameters are and conclusively show that we can use this common language across disciplines. So I started with this slide, how do artists produce elegant movements? If there is one point I'd like you to take away today, it would be that dancers modify specific aspects of walking to produce elegant movements. Now, I would like to thank all the people who have helped me in this effort. My PI, Luca, Armin, our dance coach, MIT's Latin dance coach, who, uh, urged, who taught us all of these principles in his own uh, ways and discovered them through his own uh, dance. And Greg Gage, who gave me the EMG device, is the founder of a company called Backyard Brains. Misha and Brian have uh, are collaborators on the ultrasound aspect of this project. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Megan from uh, for running the immersion lab and all the nice videos you saw from monitoring muscle stretches are thanks to the facilities set up by Megan and her team. And I didn't get to show you uh, stuff I'm doing with Ben, but uh, he's an important collaborator and we're working on building some simulations with him. So I'd like to thank uh, my uh, the people who gave me the money for this, NCSoft, uh, who also provided uh, money for the immersion lab. So uh, thank you again, and uh, I'll uh, take questions now. Neef, uh, thank you very much for the for the fascinating talk, and and please, there is the clapping available, so um, the, the virtual clapping. Um, so please raise your hand for questions or send a chat. Um, and I and I do see the first uh, questions that came in, so let me just uh, repeat that. Um, two questions: What's the sample size? A uh, number of individuals participated in the study, and were those blinded studies? Did the dancers know what you were trying to test uh, prior to the test? Uh, excellent. Thank you for asking this question. Uh, so, uh, most of the data I showed you was from me, and uh, the, however, the first experiment that I showed you uh, with the accelerometers, the subjects had no idea what I was asking them to do. All I I gave them a phone and asked them to reach forward. That's it. And uh, it, of course, one of them is a biased sample. That's me. Uh, and uh, so this project, I should say, is still in very preliminary stages. And we are in the process of setting up a more uh, intensive data collection regimen. And after the isolation dies down, Oh, we can hopefully ramp that back up. The, the second part to that question, uh, Praneeth, is have you tried to ask non-dancers to attempt the same motions the dancers did, i.e., can, can a non-dancer effectively reduce forearm muscle stress by attempting to sit up straight? Uh, right. Uh, so the most successful I have been in doing that is with the walking analogy. If I spend five minutes uh, uh, helping people through uh, uh, Break, break to break down their own walking and then slowly modify walking in a reach, I'll show you, I'll, let me show you. So right now I'm tethered 
uh, I can't do it myself. All right. Uh, see? All right. So I'm clearly walking right now, right? But yeah, am I still walking? I'm not really transporting myself, but you can, my arms look like they're walking. Right? But if I don't do that, if I try to tone down what my left arm does, I'm still walking and I can keep modifying it until what the target motion looks like what, what I want to achieve, right? Uh, and so the answer to your question is yes, I think it is definitely possible to teach non-dancers how to employ some of these strategies. Uh, however, a word of caution, it takes a while for these principles to sink in. That's just from personal experience. Great, thank you, Preneet. Uh, another question, the role of flexibility in the likelihood of walking-based muscle actuation. It's also typed in the chat if you want to see. I see, uh, no. That's a good question. Yes. Um, so the answer is you don't, I'm not very flexible. And you don't need to be that flexible to be able to incorporate these principles. So uh, the answer is you don't need to be flexible. However, through learning these principles, your flexibility will improve. Uh, I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer. <laughs> I think I think uh, it, as you recognized, it was a it's a work in progress. So okay, okay, uh, let me back up. Uh, what the, the takeaway should be? All the things we we see dancers do are simply things that are innate to us in the form of walking, and all dancers have done is they have they have gotten touch with this aspect and they have honed their skill throughout their life. And we spend all our lives, uh, you know, dedicated to some one thing or the other, right? So whether it's science, whether it's one, uh, whether it's music or whatever it is, it even though some of these things are innate, they don't just come to us. So similarly, uh, it, our work can help uh, put uh, can help design training methods that can be incorporated into the education system. So they're available to everybody. So Praneeth, I think with, with that, um, I wanna thank you very much for both the talk and the innovations in the live demos. That was, that was very, very nice. Um, so thank you all for attending the uh, Nano Explorations talk, which is also a part of our Sense Nano, our Talk Sense series. Um, and just to let you know, coming up on Tuesday, uh, April 14th, the next in the Nano Explorations talk, will be a talk by uh, Mikhail uh, Shaliganov uh, in Material Science and Engineering on reconfigurable um, meta-optics. And that is next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Uh, so Praneet, um, thank you very much. Uh, I send a virtual clap and everybody uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much everyone for attending.